Hello, everybody. Hi there. Hello. Welcome, everyone. I'll just give a little minute for everybody to connect. Okay, great. The numbers are rising. We have 12, 13 participants, 15 people are joining. So I'll just give you a minute to join. Okay, more people arriving, that's great. Okay, I think we'll have a few more participants arriving, but let me take this opportunity to say hello everybody and welcome to what is the last Relo Bangkok webinar of 2020. And as usual, we're very grateful to the US State Department for making this possible. Um, my name is Katie Wood. I'm a teacher trainer with AUA Thailand. And today um, for our webinar, I'm very pleased to welcome Rufus Nicholson. So Rufus has been involved in teaching, educating and training for many years and in many different countries. In Thailand, he's worked with several thousand uh, teachers through the boot camp, boot camp project. Um, he's also run workshops up and down the country and he has written books for Thai publishers at both the primary and secondary level. So um, we're in great hands today with Rufus. Um, he is going to be talking about student engagement. Yes, um, particularly what, why and how. So in a minute, I'll hand you over to Rufus, but can I just remind everybody, we will be using the chat box a little bit during the webinar. So please make sure that you have your, uh, your chat box changed to make messages visible to all panelists and participants. And Rufus, uh, people are already saying hello. And we've got greetings from Myanmar, from Pakistan, from Manila, from Albania, it's and from Bangkok, of course. So we've got very international crowd today. Um, as well as our uh, regular Thai teachers. So without any further talk from me, um, welcome everybody and welcome Rufus. Lovely, thank you very much, Katie. Um, thank you, Relo Bangkok as well for this um, opportunity. Uh, it's great to see people from so many different countries. <laughs> I was expecting maybe just from, from Thailand. I'm based in Thailand and as Katie said, I've got quite a lot of experience in Thailand, but um, what we're going to talk about tonight is not necessarily just uh, for Thai students. I hope that some of the ideas will be um, relevant to students all over the world. Wow, somebody from yeah. Morocco and Egypt. Um, yeah. lovely, lovely to have you all. How, what a great international um, community we've got Absolutely. here. Absolutely. Um, so for the aims of the session, as I, as I said, um, um, I've had experience of both primary and secondary. I've decided to aim the session at kind of early secondary, um, just so that it's not too broad. But a lot of the ideas could be relevant to younger students and older students, but I'm kind of um, aiming it at early secondary. Um, also, I've, I've thought about, I've, in my mind, I was thinking about teaching face to face, but I understand, especially with people from all over the world, that some of you are probably teaching online as well. So as we go through, hopefully it should be clear to see how some of these activities can be used in online teaching as well as face to face teaching. Okay. Um, what we're going to talk about is obviously not every single idea, it's just a few ideas uh, that I hope can help you with student engagement in the classroom. Um, it's really important as we go along, I'm going to be asking you to contribute in the chat. Um, so the more contributions, uh, the better, I think. So I, it's not going to be just me talking the whole time, okay? 
So I welcome any of your contributions. I welcome your questions. And also, if there's something isn't clear, please just put in the chat. Can you repeat that? I didn't understand. And I'd be happy to uh, rephrase it. OK, right. So student engagement, what, why and how. So we're going to look at the what of student engagement, the why, but most of all, we're going to look at the how because that's where we'll get our practical ideas that we can use in the classroom, okay? So let's start with what, um, engage, uh, it's a verb. And as this dictionary definition says, uh, to succeed in attracting and keeping somebody's attention and interest. And as teachers, we know that that's uh, easy to say, but not always easy to do. Um, if you look at the example sentences from this Oxford Learners Online Dictionary, you can actually see the fourth example. It was difficult to engage the students at first. So even dictionaries understand the problems that we have as teachers. OK, why should we engage our students? What's the reason to engage our students? Well, I think a lot of problems in the classroom come from students that aren't engaged for whatever reason. Uh, lack of student engagement can lead to all sorts of problems, both for the teachers and the learners and ultimately the learning experience. So let's have a look at some of those classroom problems that we may come across um, as teachers. So um, perhaps in chat, can you look at the sentence that I put up there? Can you write in chat? Can you unjumble the words and make a good sentence? This describes one issue that we might have with our students in class. Can you write in chat, please, what the, the sentence is? Very quick. Lovely, that's great. Okay. Some students are very shy. Well done, you're very good. Here's another one for you. <laughs> Can you do the same with this one? Yep, there we go. Okay, very good. Yeah, the next one. Okay, thank you. You're all correct there. Yeah. It's a bit of typing time. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, that's right. Thank you, Rajiv. Some students look bored in class. Have any of you had bored looking students in your classes? <laughs> yes, okay, right. Well, I don't have a magic wand to make you never have a bored student again in your life, but we will look at ways to try and reduce it, okay. Good, let's move on to the next one. Yep, great. Thank you again, Rajiv, you're very quick. Thank you, uh, Maribel. Yeah, some students just don't like English. OK, in, in most schools, it's something that they have to study whether they like it or not. So that's something as teachers that we have to deal with. And the last one, the longest one. See if you can work this one out. Quite a tough one, this one.
Well done, Wirani. Just one word missing there, but you're very nearly there. Okay, Rajiv and Maribel. Okay, good. Okay, so some students do not answer when I ask them a question. I've seen this a lot um, when I've watched classes, is teachers asking students, so one student maybe out of 30 children, and just asking them a question directly, um, and the student gets very shy and nervous and doesn't answer, okay? Okay, that's great. That's really good. So those are some problems that um, that, stu that we can have as teachers in the classroom. Um, before we move on, do you, are there any other problems that you have in the classroom? Just type in chat if there are any other problems that I haven't mentioned there. Yeah, introverts. Yeah, good. <laughs> yes, possibly, Rajiv, yeah. Troublemakers, okay. <laughs> okay, so obviously there are some character types that are quite difficult to control whatever you do. Um, but I think for quite a lot of students, there are things that we can do to help reduce some of these problems. Yeah, demotivated, yeah, good. Okay, so let's move on to the how. How can we engage learners? I've got a list of tips um, to help you in the classroom. Uh, that doesn't mean, as I said, this isn't a magic wand and it doesn't make every student super motivated and never unengaged but it's certainly a good start and some good habits to get into. Uh, the first one, try and use group and pair work where possible. So try to make tasks inter interactive. Um, if your classes, I suppose your classes may be 50 minutes, they may be an hour long, try to avoid that hour being just you talking to the class. Um, it doesn't matter how interesting you are, students will not pay attention to someone talking for an hour. So one way to help engage learners is to give them tasks that involve some sort of interaction. Now, some people say, well, my class, I've got 50 students and uh, it's too difficult for them to interact. As long as they can just turn to one side and speak to their partner, that's, that's uh, interaction. OK, even just doing that is fine. If you're lucky to have a smaller class where they where students can actually move around, move around a bit more, where you can move tables, perhaps, and make, let them to work in groups, then then that's great. But even just turning around for pair work is fine. You can even have blocks of, say, four where the two at the front turn around and they can work with the two people behind them. So the idea is to have tasks that takes the pressure off you and gives the um, gives the duty to the students to actually interact with each other. If they're interacting, they're less likely to cause trouble, be bored, go to sleep, play on their phones or whatever. So kind of related to that is this idea of reducing the amount of time you talk. So these these the first two tips kind of go together. Um, give the students uh, opportunity to speak together, and that means you're going to speak less. The other thing, grade your language, I think is really important. So think about the level of your students, especially if you're using English as a language to teach in, um, which I think has got lots of positives if you can actually use English as much as possible in the classroom it's important that the students understand what you're saying. Um, my daughters are learning Thai at the moment, and they said to me, they showed me the book that they study from, and they can do all the work, but they said, we don't understand what the teacher says because they teach that they speak too much and we don't understand all their words. So this is an example of the teacher 
speaking too much and using complicated language. So it's very important to grade your language down to the level of the students. It's a shortcut to demotivating students if they don't understand what you're saying, particularly if it's in another language. Number three, if possible, try to personalize activities. This simply means that connect the activities to the students' personal lives, to their experience, to their everyday lives, whether it's their friends or their families or their experience. If they're doing that, if they're speaking about something to do with their lives, number one, they may be more motivated to speak about that because it's something they know about. Um, and uh, number two, it might be interesting for them to share. OK, so personalizing activities. We can't do this in every activity, but where possible, try to make a connection between the material you're using and the student's personal life. Going back to this problem of asking students questions in front of the whole class and not getting a reply. Um, one way to help reduce this is this idea of think, pair, share. So this simply means asking a question to the whole class, but getting the students to talk about the question in pairs before you ask for an answer from them. So by doing this, you're giving them a secure little environment to work in. So they're just talking to their partner. It doesn't matter. Maybe they're not sure of the answer. They can check with their partner. They can help each other. And then once they've spoken to their partner, if the teacher then asks somebody to speak, maybe they'll have more confidence in their answer. So this might be a, a good idea to help reduce shyness um, and um, you know, people refusing to answer questions. So try not to just single out students and put them on the spot. Number five is vary your position in the classroom. Um, in some classrooms that I've watched, the teacher stays at the front of the class and the students sit at their desks. And the teacher stays in that area, like that's teacher land, and they never leave teacher land. And the students are here, and it's like there's a barrier here. You've got teacher and you've got students. So people sitting at the back of the class, well, you're inviting them to, you know, if they're not interested, you're inviting them to misbehave, to go to sleep, to do something else, to talk to their partner. So varying your position, I think, is really important. Don't live at the front of the class. Make sure that you go in amongst the students. There are several good reasons for doing this. Um, maybe some students are stuck. Maybe they need some help. If the teacher's close by, then they'll probably be less embarrassed to ask a question rather than put their hand up in front of the whole class. You can find out how well they're doing by walking around and having a, a, a look and a listen. Um, you can see if they know what to do. Maybe your instructions weren't clear. Maybe they're, they're not doing what you asked them to do so that you can, you can help and clarify if you walk around and see this. Um, they may be speaking their mother tongue when you ask them to speak English in the activity. So simply by, by walking around, your presence can actually make people continue with the activity rather than knowing that you're sitting at the front of the class and they can do whatever they want at the back of the class. So I think varying your position, monitoring the student's progress is really important. Uh, number six kind of relates to number two about reducing your teacher talk time. Try to ask questions rather than tell students everything. OK, so, um, for example, I don't know. Imagine you're going to do an activity on adverbs, let's say. Um, rather than say an adverb is a word that describes a, a verb or sometimes an adjective. And today we're going to blah, 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 blah. You're already talking a lot there. So. Another way of doing that might be just to write an adverb on the board and ask the students, what is it? What does it mean? What sort of word is it? 
Is it a verb? Is it a noun? Is it an adverb? So just simply by asking questions, you're engaging the student's brain and you're asking for a response from them. That doesn't mean that everybody's going to give you a response, but a question is something that's going to uh, make them listen more than just a statement. If you're going to ask the students to speak in English, then um, it's very important to make sure that they've got some tools to do that. So rather than just say, talk about this topic, give them some ideas, give them some help, give them some examples of language they could use to help them um, complete the speaking task. Sometimes just prompts on the board can help them as well, just to get them started, to get them going. Games can, are always useful in the class as long as they've got a language learning benefit. I know certainly in Thailand, um, students are uh, generally respond very well to games, but children aren't stupid. They know when the game has some sort of benefit for them and they know when it's just running around having fun. So it's important that there's a clear language learning benefit to the games you play in the classroom. And then finally, number nine, try to include some movement and variation in your classes. Now, I accept in big classes that that can be difficult to get all the students standing up and moving around, but certainly just variation in the type of tasks you give, uh, I think can help keep the students interested and engaged. Okay, so those are just some tips, uh, some guidelines, if you like, some things to bear in mind when you're planning your lessons. Um, and really the message here is to try and involve and switch on the students brains whenever possible. Don't give them an excuse to look out of the window or to put their heads on the desk um, or to do something else. OK, so let's have a look at some practical tasks that hopefully demonstrate some of these or put some of these tips into action. So um, let's imagine that I'm the teacher and you're the students. So teacher holds up a picture. So there's the picture and asks some questions. So the first question, is it a boy or a girl? Can you write your answers in chat, please? So have a look at the picture and say, is it a boy or a girl? Okay, that's great. You can't make it out. Somebody's not so sure. Okay, uh, there's a lot of boys there. That's good. How old do you think this person is? Good guess. We've got Ooh. eight, ten, not as old as 14. Not quite as old. Uh, OK, quite a wide variety there. Yeah. Um, actually, nine years old, I think. Nine years old. OK. Good guesses. Very good guesses. And last of all, do you recognise the picture? Do you know who the person is? Oh, <laughs> 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 Um, OK, it is me. Well done, Min Min. OK, it is me when I was nine years old. OK, um, not Donald Trump as a child. <laughs> OK, so this is me when I was younger. And now I hold up another picture. And I tell the students that I'm going to tell them some information about something that happened when I was younger. OK, I want you to listen to the information and I want you to think or try and identify who, what, when, where and why. OK, it's a very short piece of information, but I'm going to read it and I want you to identify these five questions who what when where why you can make very brief notes but don't write full sentences okay just very brief notes see if you can answer these questions 
OK, so are you ready? I'm going to read something about this picture when I was younger. When I was eight years old, I got my first bicycle. It was blue and silver and it looked great. At first, I just rode around the garden. But when I was more confident, I took it into the village and played on it with my friends. One day we rode to another village about six kilometers away. It was a real adventure and we got back after dark. I loved my bike. Okay, now we don't need to have lots of information, but just very simply, uh, who was that picture about? Can you write in chat, who was the picture about? Yeah, that's right. It was about me, about my experience. And what was it about? Just very simply. Whoops. There you go. I've given you the answer. <laughs> OK, it was by I've given you that one for free. It was about my first bike that was blue and silver. Well done. Good. When was this? Can you remember? OK. Very good. I can see some correct answers there. Good. So when I was eight years old and where, what places do I mention in the text? What places do I mention? OK. OK, good. Yeah. Garden and village is good. Well done. So at first it was around the garden, then into the village and then that journey to another village. Good. Yeah, good. Six kilometers away. Yeah. Great. And then finally, why? Why was I talking about this picture? Yep. OK, because he loved his bike. Good. So imagine the teacher in the classroom doing this with a picture. I think it's also um, it's also worth noting that the picture um, was not fantastic if we just go back to that slide. So you can ask the students, is that a beautiful picture? Is it a perfect piece of artwork? Of course it isn't. It hasn't even got any pedals, <laughs> if you look closely. So for students who are a bit shy about drawing, tell them it really doesn't matter what your picture, um, what the picture looks like, as long as someone can see what it is. So then after you've demonstrated this activity, uh, we can have a look at the instructions for the students. So first, ask them to draw a simple picture of an object a pet or even a place maybe from when they were a child. It can be from any time when they were five, six, seven, eight, any time that they remember. Uh, it could be a toy, perhaps a doll, anything. OK, so the first thing they do is to draw the picture. Make sure as you walk around that they're, they're drawing something that, that, that is identifiable. OK, and help them out where necessary. Once they've done that, then they can prepare to talk about it. And again, just giving them the five question words, who, what, where, when, why. OK, that gives them enough to start on. It means they're not going to just sit there looking into space, thinking, well, what can I say? I don't know what to say. You're giving them at least five sentences to start with. And hopefully they can say more than those five sentences. So they're preparing. They're just thinking of ideas in their heads. Make sure they don't write out long sentences because then they're just reading sentences, which isn't really a speaking activity. They might need to have some um, support with the tense. So obviously, if we're talking about when they were younger, they need to use past tenses. Maybe 
this could follow on from a lesson where you've looked at past tenses. Um, maybe they've done it a few weeks ago, which means you might need to refresh their memory on some past tense verbs, for example. OK, once they've done that, they can work in pairs. One person shows their picture to the partner and first get the let the partner guess what what the picture's about. Again, you're now engaging the listener as well as the speaker. You're getting the listener involved and they can look at the picture and give their ideas. It also gives them a reason to listen when the person describes their picture because they can see if their guesses were correct or not. All right. Um, so let the student guess and then um, they, the uh, person with the picture can describe. Once they've done that, make sure they change around and they can repeat the activity. OK, so it's a simple speaking activity that relates to each person's life. OK, let's just go back to those nine tips and the activity I've just described. Can you just write down the numbers of the tips that we included in that speaking activity? So, for example, number one, was there any group work and pair work? Well, yes, there was pair work because they're talking to each other. So tip number one was used. Can you write down some more of those tips that were included in that last activity, please? Just write the numbers in chat, please. OK, thanks. OK, so I'm asking, yeah, I'm asking which tips we included in that speaking activity about when I was younger. So I said tip number one, we used pair work. OK, right. Good. OK, thanks for those. Yes, certainly number one, we said. Certainly number two, because when the students are talking, the teacher should be saying nothing. Um, three, yes, most of you got that. It's personalised. The students are talking about something from their own memory. So that should be motivating for them. Um, I also had this the idea of supporting students with language. Remember to give them some help with the past tense, for example, before they speak. Um, and also actually drawing a picture and using it to speak and describe is something a bit different, a bit different than just looking at the opening your book at page 25 or something. Good. Um, obviously, things like varying your position in the classroom. Of course, you can do that during the activity as well. OK, great. Good. Let's move on to another speaking activity. Now, as teachers, it's hard to avoid uh, these sort of tasks. They might be in the book at the beginning of a unit. It might be something that you start off a lesson with. What did you do at the weekend? Talk about your free time. Well, they're OK. Motivated students will maybe have something to say, but we may be losing some of those less motivated students with something that's just given as a question. So can we make this more engaging for learners? So again, I'm going to demonstrate uh, an, a way of doing this where hopefully it's a little bit more engaging for the learners. OK, so I looked through my mobile phone and I chose this picture from my mobile phone. So it's obviously something connected to my life. Let's go back to our friends, those prompt words. OK, and. I would like you to look at that picture and I would like you to guess who the people are in the picture. So remember, this is something about my life, my free time. Who do you think the people are in the picture? Can you write in chat? Yeah, OK, great. You've got that. Well, yes, 
daughters, two girls, daughters. That's right. Yes, they're both girls. And what is the picture of? So uh, what am I describing? OK. Oh, I've given you that again. <laughs> I've given you another free one. So I'm talking about a holiday. This is a holiday. I don't live on the beach, unfortunately. This was a holiday. Um, and where do you think this beach is? Can you guess? Where do you think the beach is? Okay, some good guesses there. Huihin, Cha'am, Patia, Chonburi. No, it's closer to Phuket. It's just below Phuket. Can you tell me the province below Phuket? What province is below Phuket? Yes, that's OK, right. You're getting very close. It's actually Riley Beach in Krabi. OK, Krabi province. OK. So that was a Thai beach. When do you think this was? Can you guess? When do you think I had a holiday? OK, summer. Um, it was actually last month. Yeah, it was this year and it was last month. And why do you think we had a holiday? Because of COVID. <laughs> um, no, not COVID. Yes, to have fun. OK, good answers. Getting bored, working from home, break routine. Yes, it was nothing special. It was just to relax and have a break, uh, to have a break from work with the family. OK, so this photograph I took from my mobile phone. So, again, you can show this to your students. You can project it on a screen or whatever. You can print it out and have it as a picture and you can include the students. They might be interested to know about you and your free time. OK. So once you've done that, then we go over to the students. Um, the first instruction is ask them on their mobile phones to find a picture or pictures of something that they did in their free time or last weekend or a holiday or whatever that they don't mind sharing. OK, give them some time to do that. Then again, help them to prepare. Think of some sentences. We can use who, what, where, when, why again, so that the weaker students don't get stuck. All right, who? Well, it was me, or it was my friends, or it was my family. Okay, you're giving them, a, you're giving them some support and guidance there. Um, again, we're talking about the past tense, so similar to the previous activity, they might need some, some refreshing of how to use the past tense or they might have had a, a, a lesson very recently about the past tense. Similar to the last activity, then they can then show their phone to their partner and their partner can um, guess the information and the, uh, the person with the phone can then give sentences. It could, it could even be adapted to be a question and answer activity. So one person, the listener, could be saying, who's that person on the right and who's the person with them? Oh, that's my friend and that's my uh, sister, for example. So you could change it into a question and answer activity. The nice thing about this is you're giving something for the listener and the speaker to do so that they're both involved in the activity. It's not just one person talking and the other one looking out of the window. OK, so again, that's another simple personalized speaking activity that's quite student centered as well once the students are working on it. OK, I want to move on to writing tasks now. We've done a bit of speaking. Let's have a look at writing tasks. And here's a quote. Writing's a waste of classroom time and should just be given for homework. What do you think about that? Do you think that's that's true? Do you agree with that statement? Um, just write in chat what you think. 
writing is best done at home rather than in class. What do you think? Okay, nice to see plenty of no answers. Okay, someone says it depends. I, I, yes, that's a good answer as well. Okay, good. So um, let's have a look then at how writing can be made more engaging. I certainly agree that writing can and should be done in the classroom. Um, how can we make it more engaging? Some students think that it's uh, that it's boring. Some teachers think it's boring and that's the problem because if the teachers think it's boring, then the students are certainly going to think it's boring as well. So how can we make writing a little bit more engaging? Um, the first thing that can help is aiming for real life like tasks. So um, give them something that they may do in their own language in real life. So that could be blog posts, it could be emails, it could be chats, messages, online reviews, uh, online profiles, things like that. So where possible, try to give them something that's meaningful and they can connect to their real life. I think it's also important to support them. Don't just give them a title and say, write about that. Um, give them some uh, support. And one way of doing that is to give them an example text. So if you want them to write an email, you could use an email of your own and then give them some tasks and you could highlight the structure. You could highlight some relevant language, some vocabulary, perhaps, that will help them then in their writing. And I think most of us would agree that when we write in our own languages, we mostly do it actually alone. Even if we're sitting with other people, it's something that we do by ourselves. So um, rather than have whole lessons in silence, um, it's really important for the preparation and or the feedback stages to be interactive. OK, so I think it is possible to make uh, uh, writing uh, more engaging and even interactive. I'd like to show you an interactive writing task that I've done with students and with teachers as well in teacher training um, that's generally gone really well. And it's an example of interactive writing. Um, so I'm just going to describe this. I'm not going to ask you to do this. Uh, first of all, set the context. Um, you could talk about different ways of communication. You could ask the students how they uh, how they communicate, for example, and see if you can get this idea of online messaging, which I think a lot of people use nowadays. So it should be familiar. So set this context. Tell the students that they're going to be friends and they're going to be com communicating uh, online. Okay. Now. Uh, you, they're not really going to be online, although I think it's possible to do this, but more, more, it's more complicated and tricky. So this lesson, they're going to pretend they're online. So the first, the first thing is the layout. The students are going to sit back to back. So the other student behind them looking the other way. They'll have a blank piece of A4 paper, uh, and that's going to be the screen that they're going to write on. And you just need one of these between for each pair. You could have a look at, at, at messaging, um, maybe some short model texts that we talked about before. Have a look at what sort of language is used in uh, online messaging. Is it formal? Is it informal? Maybe even have a look at some vocabulary or perhaps some little expressions that could be useful to use then students are going to write short messages on the screen and they're going to hand it over to their partner. So they're not going to see what their partner is writing. They're just going to wait and then they're going to receive the paper. They're going to read and they're going to reply and then hand the paper back. So the paper is going to go backwards and forwards. You tell the students that they're going to do this in silence. OK, 
Now, I generally find um, that it starts off in silence, but people start to laugh halfway through. And I'll tell you why. So once you've set that up, each student then gets a roll card. So this student will have one roll card and this student will have a different roll card. So in this activity, student A, this is their roll card. Try to find a suitable time to pick up the speakers. So like music speakers uh, that you lent your partner. You want the speakers back because you're going to have a party at the weekend, but you don't want to invite your partner. OK, try to think of another excuse to tell them a reason for getting your speakers back. And then really push them for a time to pick your speakers up. OK, so that's one student. That's student A. Student B, you borrowed your friend's music speakers, but you dropped them and they're being repaired. So they're broken at the moment. But you don't want to tell your friend that the speakers are broken. OK, so try to delay returning them to your friend until next week uh, when they're when they've been fixed already. So here you're setting up a situation where they've both got different reasons. They've both got different objectives. Then they start writing and they can start with a hi. How are you? Because they're friends. And then they can start negotiating about these speakers. As I said, it's done in complete silence. Um, but generally, I find about halfway through, people start to laugh as people start giving excuses uh, and uh, people understanding that the situation is quite amusing. So that's just one example of how writing can be made interactive. You're involving every student. OK, um, each student has got a, a need uh, and has got a motivation to actually be involved in the activity. If they don't take part, then they don't achieve their goal on their roll card. OK, so I think if this is set up, uh, another important point is that, that your students are the right level. Your students need to be a, a reasonably high level because the papers need to be passed over quite quickly. If one student's waiting five minutes for a reply, then you're going to get bored misbehaving students. So this is done better with higher levels so you can keep this the speed of the activity going. OK. Right. I want to move on now. Time's short. I want to move on to course books and modifying course book content. So I, I suppose that most teachers have some sort of course book to guide them as a syllabus for their teaching. Now, um, I write books as well, and I know that it's impossible to write a course book that's uh, that a teacher can just pick up and do without thinking about it, okay, and following all the activities. So it's important as teachers to look at your course books and see how you can perhaps make them more engaging for your students. One, one thing to look out for is um, at something you can see on the slide. So uh, this is an example where whoever wrote this book is probably living in the West somewhere or is very Western orientated. Um, what's the problem if you ask the students in your class to say, tell me some information about the people on there? So um, it's quite small. So I'll just read out. There's Agatha Christie, Neil Armstrong, Michael Jackson, uh, the Beatles, Steve Jobs and Audrey Hepburn. Now, what might be a problem for some students here? Yeah, good. Yeah. So maybe maybe someone, maybe an English person, for example, or an American person might be familiar with these people. But why should a, a student in rural Thailand know these people? They probably won't. So if you see that in your course book, it would be a good idea to change it. So, for example, you could um, uh, change them to be people that are either more famous currently or maybe from your part of the world. And that will start the lesson on a more positive note. If you start the lesson showing pictures of people they don't know, then this can lead to boredom and all the problems that we spoke about earlier on. OK. Um, 
the next thing I want to look at, and I'm going to do this quite quickly um, because I can see the time is getting short. Um, making content more engaging. So this is a, a page from a book called New World. Um, I, I just took this, I just used this book because uh, I know that Thai teachers, I know this is quite popular in Thai schools. Um, there's nothing wrong with this book. I'm just using this as an example. Okay. Um, now I had a look at this. There's a conversation on there. It's between two people. One of them's called Gabe and one of them's called Nick. Um, and in the book, it says, listen to the conversation and answer the questions. Uh, yes, sorry, Maribel, you can say localize the content, localize or personalize. Yes, you can do that. Thanks. Um, OK, so this is listening with some questions. So you could say open your book at page 82, listen to this and answer the questions. Not very engaging, less motivated, less capable students might not be interested in that. So how can we make this more engaging? I've made uh, a seven, I think an eight stage lesson to use with this context. And as I said, I'm going to go through this quite quickly. So I looked at this course book and I thought, hmm, I need to make this a little bit more interesting. So what did I do? Let's have a look. So, um, oh, sorry, sorry, before we do this, here are some tips for making the content more engaging. So first of all, have a look at the aims of the material. What is it? What's the, the aims of the material in the book of the activity or the exercise? So are they balanced? Are they receptive and productive? So for in this case, there's listening. So there is there any speaking? There's no speaking on that page. Is there an engaging introduction to the content? Well, there's no suggestions in the book as to how you could start this lesson or this page. Um, is there a chance for the students to interact? Well, again, on this page, there was no, there was nothing on the page that, that required the students to interact. So I decided, I looked at that content on the page and I decided to do this. So I'll just take you through the stages that, that I worked through. So the first one, the information was, um, I know I went a little bit quick, but Gabe was the the um, the guy who had a problem with because he felt he was too fat. OK, and he's telling his friend about it and his friends giving advice. So stage one, let's start with problems in life. So I would start by saying perhaps showing them a picture of a broken heart and getting the students to tell me not about individual problems, but about general areas where we can have problems. So it could be love could be money, could be family and friends, could be work or school, or it could be health. So now the students are thinking about, yes, people have problems commonly in their lives. The next stage is to stimulate interest in the characters. OK, so I've got a picture of Gabe and I've got a picture of Nick. Um, and I've also got three questions. So just looking at the pictures. So remember, the students haven't looked at the conversation yet. So just by looking at the pictures, why is Gabe not happy? What does Gabe like to eat and what does he not like to eat? Now, here's a good opportunity for a think pair share. You could get the students into pairs and just get them guessing. Tell them it doesn't matter. They, it doesn't matter if their guesses are wrong. But what do they think by looking at the pictures? Get some ideas from what they say. And then this gives them a reason to listen, because in the next stage, you can play the listening from the book. And now they can check the answer to those three questions. They've got a reason to listen. It's not just randomly listening and answering questions. Were their guesses correct? All right, so we're giving them motivation. So after they have finished and you've checked the answers to that, you can then identify the key language. So the text is about giving advice. Nick is giving advice to Gabe about the things he should and he shouldn't eat to help him lose weight. OK, so it would be a good idea for the teacher to pull out that language, the should and the shouldn't in particular. 
um, and don't just tell them ask the students maybe they could listen again what words does nick use when he helps gabe get them to listen and get them to tell you okay remember asking not telling uh, the next stage you might want to just give check that the students can pronounce these words so should for some students that can cause a problem with the silent l for example you could give them practice with the shouldn't, with the contraction of putting the words together so that they're comfortable. And then give them some controlled practice. So this means just copying some, some sentences, perhaps using a role play of the dialogue from the book. So at this stage, they could actually open their books for the first time and role play the dialogue. So just so that they can get used to the conversation. So stopping it at that, kind of doesn't seem enough. We need to give the students some more, um, more spontaneous speaking practice and interaction with their partners. So what I decided to do, and it's not in the book, but I decided that Nick has got a problem as well. So, okay, Gabe has his problem, but Nick has a problem as well. So then I'd ask the students, what do they think Nick's problem is? Um, get some guesses from them um give them a clue okay and then you can say yes look nick's got a broken heart his girlfriend's just left him okay then you can start thinking okay well now it's gabe's turn to give nick some advice so what do you think what advice does gabe give nick to help him with his uh, broken heart problem remind them of the language you should you shouldn't and then you can set up a role play where Gabe gives Nick some advice. And this provides some nice spontaneous um, speaking practice. And um, I've seen students and teachers as well when I've done it in training sessions, uh, really enjoy this. They really get into the role of having a, one of them having a broken heart and the other one giving them all sorts of uh, um, advice. Some of it unusual, some of it good, um, but generally it makes it into a very engaging activity. So just going back, um, that's the original text that I looked at, okay? Um, it was simply a, a listening and reading of a text and some questions, that's all, that's all there were. So just by following those steps, I've tried to make that more lesson, that lesson more engaging and involving for students. So I think going back to one of the problems we said right near the beginning that some students uh, don't like English, they're not interested in learning English. That doesn't mean that they can't be engaged in the 40 or 50 minutes or the hour that they're in the classroom. OK, even if they're not particularly interested in learning the language, at least they can have some tasks that they can um, get involved in. Yes, sorry, I've just seen on the chat. Yes, that role play can become a counselling session. Yes, uh, can become very amusing. Um, so. Just to just to kind of sum up with that, so that was a listening text. Um, it also applies to reading texts. Make sure that you have an engaging introduction to the topic, some sort of pictures, questions, something to stimulate interest. So you're avoiding this, open your book and do this. Get, get the students interested at first. Try and give students a reason for reading or for listening so that when they do read or listen, they've got a purpose and hopefully they're a little bit more motivated. You don't always have to do predictions, but predictions come from the, the student. Again, it's personalised. It's their predictions. It's their guesses. So when they come to read or listen, they've got an interest in finding out if they were right or not. Um, and then look for ways to increase interaction and that can be after the text we've just done some speaking and if it's reading texts you can use uh, jigsaw reading texts now i understand that we're nearly out of time but can somebody tell me can you tell me in the chat if you know what jigsaw readings are 
So using a text for jigsaw readings. Just write in chat if you know what that means, please. OK, Sabrine, you do, um, but some other people don't. Well, as we're out of time, I don't want to start something that could take quite a long time. So maybe, maybe there's another webinar in this next year um, to help you. OK, I can see. Yeah, divide the writing into pieces. It's where you divide one text into two parts, basically. Um, but we haven't really got time to start doing that. Um, but perhaps that can be some homework for you for the new year is to find out what jigsaw readings are. They're very useful. Uh, and I think you'll find that they can be adapted to a lot of the texts that you find in your course books. So um, we're beaten by the clock there. So I'm going to finish there by saying thank you very much for coming. Thank you for your contributions in chat. I hope you have a very engaging new year, um, both with your friends and family and your students. Uh, if you want to um, catch up with me on Facebook, I've got a Facebook page that you can get um, that you can find at Teaching Ideas, T-E-L-T. -E it's, uh, it's just some practical ideas to help you in the classroom that you might find um, interesting. Other than that, thank you very much. And I'm going to hand back to Katie. Have a good new year. Bye-bye. So all that's left for me to say is uh, thank you once again to Rufus. Um, I'm sure we all agree that there's a great session there with loads of practical takeaway ideas you can use in your your classroom um, and also to once again thank uh, Relo Bangkok for making this webinar possible. Um, just a reminder that the webinar is recorded so it will be available if you want to watch it and um, to take more time to look again at all of those ideas that Rufus has provided. Um, you can find those on the Relo Bangkok um, YouTube channel or go to the Relo Bangkok Facebook page. You'll be able to find out uh, more information from there. So also for me, Happy New Year. <laughs> and thank you very much for attending. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>